Well, uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord, good morning. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to extend my uh, thankfulness to the JEC family. As uh, known to most of you, last July 4, I had a procedure, and I thank you for your prayers, support, and encouragement. It's uh, something I truly appreciate. Thank you very much. Now, going back to our message, I was given the topic, Rejoice, the Lord is our strength. You know, about 19 years ago to this day, I had a major car accident. In that particular day, it was a Sunday afternoon. I was going from one engagement to the other, and I had that accident near Fairview in the Neapolitan Road. I totaled my car. I really felt bad. You know, I didn't have a major problem in terms of the impact of that accident, but I really felt bad because my car got ruined then. My dad was calling me up, and he was asking me, how are you? I was saying, I'm okay, but my car is ruined. You know? People came to that location to assist me, and they were asking me, how are you? I keep saying I'm okay, but I was focusing on the car. It was ruined. I don't have a car anymore. It was my first car ever. So I felt bad. Now, why this title, Rejoice, the Lord is our strength? You know, when we are experiencing something not so ideal in our lives. It may be a crisis. It may be a trial. Probably it's a sickness. Well, we are emotionally down. In our minds, we are weak. We become pessimistic. We are focusing on the negative stuff. When we are experiencing pain, we tend to resort to blaming, looking for the reasons why these things took place, why they happened and why God allowed it to happen. And uh, of course, during such times, we are experiencing the difficulty of coping with the loss. Now, this is the reason, I think, why we need to really change our attitude and then refocus again on God, because there's a tendency for us to be taken in by the downward spiral. So we have to keep our confidence in the Lord. Now, when your confidence in God is restored, Two things are present. You're once again trusting in Him. You know, I have uh, come to understand that many people have a different view of faith as what is presented in the Bible. You know, I've been doing Bible studies also with non-Christians. When you ask them about faith, they think it's, it's a one-time experience. They would answer this way if you ask them, do you have faith in God? I think so. I know Him. And I think we're okay. I have not offended him. I'm trying to do my best to live according to what he wants. But then when you ask for more details, how much do you know about him? Many people don't even want to read the Bible. Many people don't even know what God wants. So faith needs to grow because the more you know about who God is, the detail of how he revealed his nature, his character, what he wants, what he does not want, and you comply. That's the only time that you really mature in the faith. So when a person once again comes to God, connects with God, communes with God, then his confidence with God is restored. But there's another thing that's actually developed in your life. It's called humility. You know, sometimes we resist the will of God in our lives. You don't want what's taking place. But then, when you come to God again, when you talk to Him again, when you request from Him, him again, you're now submitting yourself to His authority, and you're once again recognizing He's the only one who can help you. Now, when we talk about Habakkuk 3, 16 to 19, I do know that when you've read the three chapters of this book, you have come to realize that most likely the person had a shifting of emotions. Actually, when you look at these scholarly criticisms about the book of Habakkuk, they're saying that the first two chapters might be written by another person, and the third chapter could have been written by a different person. Why? Because in the first two chapters, here's the prophet. He was not living the ideal uh, way of life and the ideal connection with God. He was actually doing a question and answer with the Lord. In, in a sense, he was debating with God. He didn't like what God was making him see about the future that he intends to allow Israel to, exp to experience. And here he was, resisting what the Lord wanted. 
instead of simply receiving the message and delivering it to those who are recipients of that message by the Lord. But then when you look at Habakkuk in chapter 3, here he was coming to God and he is now having a change of heart. So the major question is, how did that happen? People are questioning it couldn't be the same person. But I do believe in your own personal experiences, it's the same thing. Maybe there was a time you were feeling hurt. Maybe there was a time that you thought that God had bad intentions for you. Maybe there was a time that you felt that God was not moving in your favor. And yet, as you come to realize His will, as you come to know about His purposes for you, then a shifting happens. You look back regretful of how you treated God, repentant of how you behaved, and now you're coming to God and saying to the Lord, as long as you're with me, I'm okay. I will be okay. And that's the shifting that the Lord can provide for a person. That's what he can do. He's a specialist in that. He's patiently waiting for our understanding of his will, continuously uh, accompanying us in the difficulties of our life situations, giving us patience when he was correcting us. And then in the end, as we are processed by God's plan and program, we then turn to him and say, I'm willing to submit to what you want. I believe you know what is better for me. And uh, here in Habakkuk, that's we can that what we can find. You know, in chapter 3, when we look at Habakkuk here, uh, this is the ideal, sure, lifestyle of a prophet. What's uh, the ideal? Well, look at the different prophets of the Old Testament. There are those who are ideal in a sense. You have Isaiah. He was given by God the uh, uh, foresight that you will be doing a ministry to a group of stubborn people. They will not turn and change during your lifetime. But he preached. He said what God's message was to the people. And of course, in effect, he was sown in half and he was killed for it. And even though he did not see the people turn, he gave his all in service. Ideal. We know of Jeremiah sent by God to an influential leader. He spoke God's word. He was so hated by that leader, he was actually thrown into a cistern. And he was even a person who underwent the difficulty that Israel had undergone. But he was faithful to God, encouraging the people. Ideal. But there are those who are not acting in the ideal sense. We know of Jonah. You're familiar with the prophet, right? God told him to go to Nineveh. He went the opposite direction. It required that a fish swallow him and then uh, basically spew him out to Nineveh so that he will be able to do God's will there. But you know what? When you look at the uh, writings of Jonah, quite short, and he was effective in a short period of time. The prophet preached, the people turned, and not only that, they repented, and uh, you should be happy. He had an effective ministry. But what happened to Jonah? He didn't like it. He didn't like the Ninevites. By the way, Jonah was a prophet to the Gentiles. The people of Nineveh were from a city of, uh, now we call it Iraq, the Assyrian Empire. But uh, when he was to be preaching to them, he didn't want that because their ancestors were abused by the ancestors of these Assyrians. And he didn't want them to repent. He wanted the punishment of God to be given to these people. But they changed. They sought God's forgiveness. You should be happy. He didn't want it. So he, he had to be taught by God a lesson using uh, the leaves and the worm. Uh, Habakkuk was the same. You're expecting a, a submissive servant of God, not somebody who debates with God. But in chapter 3, the demeanor of Habakkuk changed. You're aware of the different kinds of prayer, like, right? We simplify prayer with ACTS. We have adoration, we have confession, we have thanksgiving, and we have supplication. When we talk about Habakkuk, it is a prayer of supplication. He was actually requesting something from the Lord. Now let's look at the three parts of his prayer so that it will lead to the conclusion in chapter 3, verses 16 to 19. The first one is a prayer for revival. Now, 
many people are probably asking, why was he requesting a revival? It was absent during their time. Maybe he was actually reading about the background of the Israelites. There were generations who saw the mighty acts of God. Miracles were performed. He saw how the Lord uh, personally moved, even altered nature, so that the people of God will be rescued from the distress and even their enemies. How come it was not happening during their time? In the first two chapters, he was basically questioning God. How come you, a righteous God, would allow an unrighteous people to even overtake your chosen people? Well, the Lord was quite patient with Habakkuk, and he even was trying to answer Habakkuk's inquiry. And in the, in the end, Habakkuk realized it was their fault. It was not God. Sometimes we're thinking, well, the Lord is far away from me. Remember, motion is relative. The Lord is there. Probably it's not him who moved away. It was you who was moving away from him. The Israelites were no longer worshiping God faithfully. If they do offer sacrifices, they were not happy. They turned away from him and worshiped the Baals. And that's how they were living their lives, not obeying the laws that were given by God for them to live by. And yet they were accusing God of being unfaithful. The Lord even told Habakkuk, look at your history. Where did you find the sun standing still? The sea parted. You were provided bread because I provided manna for that generation in the desert. I provided meat. And then Habakkuk realized the Lord was faithful. And despite of their unfaithfulness and their turning away, the Lord was there still awaiting their change of life still awaiting their coming back to Him. But you know why they were not experiencing the fullness of God? And this is a matter you have to remember. You cannot expect to have the fullness of the blessing of God if you are not obeying God. Let me repeat that. You cannot expect to experience the fullness of the blessing of God if you're not obeying God. Remember, the promises of God in the Bible are all conditional. God will do his part faithfully, but you have to also do your part faithfully. Look at some of the passages. No? We've been uh, saying this for the past few times I had my chance to preach here. In Matthew 6.33, that's probably one of the better passages to use. Seek first his kingdom and righteousness. That's your part. And all these things shall be added unto you. That is God's part. This is a conditional promise. John 15, 7 is another one. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, that is our part. Ask whatever you wish and it shall be given you. That is his part. It means it's conditional. You will have the fullness of God's blessing if you are faithful to him. If not, you cannot expect that. That will go contrary to his will. So let's look at his prayer for revival. He was saying, Lord, we would like to see a revival, that, but that would be a difficult uh, a request. How come? Because this time, he will double his effort, not only siding with the Israelites, but this time siding with God. And he had to preach faithfully uh, to the people of Israel, even though if they have hardened hearts and even though they will be stubborn, he had to give his all. Remember one time I was talking to my dad, I think it was late elementary years or early high school years, I told him, why did you name me Jonathan Edwards? My name is too long, I'm having a hard time writing it on paper. Well, he said he's an American revivalist and theologian, that's the reason why I named you that. Do you realize the struggle I had when I was grade one, grade two, and I had to write my name? Everybody else is finished. I have not finished yet because my name will take up so many lines and I have to make use of so many pad papers. Uh, he was smiling, but he said he, created, he has been used by God to have an impact in, in his society, in his generation. And I was reading a little bit of his background since he's my namesake, and uh, I found out that he had a preaching, sinners in the hands of a mighty God. <laughs> what kind of a preaching is this, no? But he was quite intense. He goes to communities who are believing in Jesus, communities who are not believing in Jesus, and he would preach. It required a person 
so faithful to go to people who would like him and who would resist him. But he will be doing his job faithfully so that the people will realize God's will, turn from their ways, and then follow God. And so a revival was experienced during his generation and after that. But it would be difficult for the servant. It would be difficult for the messenger. Habakkuk was now ready to take up the challenge. And he knew only God can work, up, work out a revival. Only as we put in our activities, spiritual revival, because we want to have it. But what is a revival in the first place? That's a question. You know, one time, our music team, we had a worship through music. It was really touching. People were crying, some were raising their hands. They were taken in by the worship through music. Then after that event, we had an evaluation. One of the musicians asked me, a young person, Pastor, is this the revival? People were crying. People were surrendering their lives when the preaching was given. I said, it may be the start of it, but it may not even be a revival. And he was surprised. Why? This is the ideal. People raising their hands, crying. I said, this is what we call an emotional experience. It's also part of it. I'm not saying it's bad because when you love God, you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The whole being is in involved. But if you are crying and yet you don't leave behind sins in your life that grieve the Lord, you're not revived. You're just crying in the singing. You're taken in by the emotions of the singing, right? You may be raising your hands. You're so happy. The singing was a celebration of God. But God is telling you to commit to something you don't want to commit to the will of the Lord. Then there's no revival. There is just an emotional elation. You see the difference? Yes, this may be part of it, maybe the starting point, but the life of the person should turn away from what displeases the Lord and then pursue the will of God. That's the authentic revival. It has to happen in our daily life that the Lord will be the focus and object of our surrender. Now here, when uh, Habakkuk was praying for a revival, he realized they needed to participate. It's not all God's work. He will have his role and we will have our roles. And then he said, he requested from God that he will make a revival known. He wants it to happen in their time frame. He wants to see it. But they're about to experience difficulty. He knew very well that the only chance that their lives will truly experience the blessing of God, even in the midst of the trial they will undergo, even during the difficulty that they will be overtaken by the Babylonians. But if they are going back to God, the change will already happen personal, the community will come together to recognize the Lord even in the midst of difficulty, which happens most of the time. In difficulty, then suddenly people get to have a realization. They, we need God. We need to follow God. We need to honor God. And so after that, if they are restored by the Lord, they will still commit to doing what He wants. And so this is now the prayer of Habakkuk, a prayer for revival. Now, the, the next prayer that he had was a prayer for mercy. Why the prayer for mercy? Habakkuk was aware after having a conversation with God and God enumerating all of their offenses, they deserve his wrath rather than his grace and his kindness. True. You know, as I evaluate myself and humankind in general, when we do something wrong, we would like to be excused from the consequence and we still want to expect the blessing. We have a lopsided way of looking at justice. We want to be given reprieve from accountability, and we would like to have the maximization of the blessing, and yet we would like to do things our way. We don't want to follow the guidelines and the rules of God. Cannot happen that way. So Habakkuk, realizing their error, and that the Lord was standing there faithfully waiting for their, uh, for their change, he knew very well. I had to come to God. Remember two other servants of God. You know Nehemiah. Before they rebuilt the wall, before the people came together to help, he requested from God that they be forgiven. Daniel was the same thing. These servants of God understood the community first had to repent because we have done so much offenses against him. And so when he came to God, he recognized that God deserved praise. You know why? 
because when they were making all of their, uh, they were committing disobediences, they were still blaming God for the consequences. That's unfair. They made the action of turning away from Him. He gave them the, the laws for them to follow so that they would be able to thread the right course to, to His blessing. They did things contrary to His will. And when things got ruined, it became bad for them. They blamed God. And so what did the Lord want them to do? Actually, if you look at this particular part in verses 3 to 15, He's saying, really, nobody can go against you. Even powerful armies collapse in front of you. You are the Almighty. But then this time he would like to commit to God by having a covenant with him. Now, what is a covenant? Sound check? Yeah. So what is a covenant? A covenant is an agreement between two parties. God is telling Israel, I'm going to be faithful to you. And Israel in return will also make a commitment of telling God, I'm going to be faithful to you. Have you ever seen a wedding happen? That's a covenant between two people. A promise between a man and a woman to be faithful to each other in the sight of God, in the sight of the witnesses, in the sight of each other. Why would God want a covenant? Uh, well, uh, first let's look at the human condition. I have counseled people, and there are those who don't want to make a promise in front of God. They don't want to make a commitment or a covenant with the Lord. You know why? Some are saying, I don't want to commit to God to give a promise to Him because I might not be able to fulfill. So the person is thinking, I don't have the strength or maybe I will have a moment of weakness that I won't be able to commit to what I have stated. I won't be able to uh, really do what I have said to the Lord. So there's that fear, a self-doubt. Others don't want to make a commitment to God because they're actually taking care of something that the Lord wants. It may be a pet sin. It may be a compromise in their lives. It may be something that they're quite conscious of that is displeasing to the Lord, that if they make a commitment with God, they will be letting go of all these things, and that will be inconvenient for them. But that's the whole point of making a covenant. You prioritize God. You give your best in doing His will, and you will live pleasing Him. That's the whole point. Why? With a covenant, you upgrade your level. <laughs> One time in uh, school, no? uh, you would be telling students, well, you have to be uh, subjected to penalties because you were caught cheating, for example. And they would be shocked. Why not give me a uh, pardon? Okay, uh, just uh, let this particular case or incident go. Well, then you have to revert back to the student handbook, which they never read, I think. <laughs> Sometimes they're even surprised it's in the student handbook. For example, you say page 38, section D, paragraph 3. If you're caught cheating, you will be suspended for a week or you will be given a failing grade, for example. But then, if a person read that, understood the commitment, you have an expectation about how the school should treat you as a student, but the school would have an expectation of how you will be treating the school as one of its participants, as part of that organization. So by signing your name there, you're actually up upgrading your level. You want to be accountable. In companies, it's the same thing. Why do you sign a contract? Because if you don't sign a contract, it's easy for you not to fulfill your commitments. Oh, it's uh, no, uh, working hours. I don't care. So, kulang kumain. Well, you can do that. There's no commitment. But with the signing of the contract, you're forced to commit to what is necessary, what is right, and what is appropriate. In the same sense, we are supposed to make a covenant with God. We have to make a commitment to the Lord. By doing so, you will give all of your strength into doing this. You will make yourself responsible and accountable in leaving behind the things that will offend the Lord. And your life in the faith will be upgraded. And that's the whole point. And that's what Habakkuk was being uh, told by the Lord. That's why he was saying to the Lord, Lord, I would like to request from you that you give us salvation. The part that he was requesting for salvation was after 
he was or after he was saying he, after saying to the Lord, we're willing to do what it takes, especially him, as a prophet, as a servant. So he was praying for mercy. But then when you look at verses 16 to 19, this time the prayer was a prayer for strength. Why strength? Well, when he saw what the Lord allowed him to see about the future of Israel, it's not going to be easy. They will be overtaken by a powerful nation. Actually, when that happened, the walls of Jerusalem were destroyed. The city got burned, and even the temple of God was uh, burnt, and it was ransacked. Some people have been asking that. I was doing a study of the book of Daniel with some groups, and people were asking in chapter 1, why would God allow his house to be burnt down? Isn't it an insult to him that the king Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon has ransacked his house and has destroyed it and has taken all of the wealth that was there and placed it in the temple of his god, most likely the god Dagon? And why would God allow that to happen? To teach Israel a lesson. When my house was there, you did not regard it with importance. When the worship and the sacrifices was available, you did not do it with love, respect, and willfulness. Now that everything is gone, now you cry out to me and say, Lord, how can we worship you now? When it was there, you were not worshiping him the right way. How can we sacrifice your house is no longer here? But when it was there, you were not sacrificing properly. Lord, how can we show you our love? That's the whole point. When everything was there, you were not showing true love for him. Now that it's gone, you're going to use it in order to make him realize that there was something wrong. Maybe it's your fault that you allowed this to happen. No. God was conscious about what he allowed. And this is probably part of the lesson. You most likely will appreciate my presence and the importance of being close and committed to me when these things are not yet there for the moment. Imagine that. So look at Habakkuk's prayer for strength. He recognized his own weakness before a powerful God. This time he was not resisting. He was requesting a change of heart. You know, one time I was given the chance to speak here about humility. And remember our biblical working principle about humility? It's not first and foremost humility between man to man. No. Humility is something that you apply first between you and God. Maybe you're thinking, isn't it automatic that I will humble myself in the sight of God? No. How come? Because when the Lord gives you a command and you do not follow, you cannot say, I am humble before him because you don't want to submit to him. When he gives you a promise and you do not trust in him, well, definitely you don't have much faith in him. And so you cannot be above God's will. Your, your will is not equal with God's will. The only proper place of our situation, our will, is beneath God's will. That is humility. And it is assumed in the Bible. If you can humble yourself before God, then most likely humility can be part of your character trait. And you can even apply it to mankind, even institutions. But if you cannot humble yourself before the Creator... Before the Savior, believe me, you won't apply it to anybody else. That's because pride will be present in your life. And here you look at Habakkuk. He was now admitting, we are weak, but you are a powerful God. We know you can help us. What would be his basis? He can look back in their history. Many times over, there were difficulties in their condition as a nation. But when God gives his promises, he delivers. Look at what has taken place in Egypt. He knew about that. He knew about how the Lord has actually allowed Israel to survive, even though it's just a small nation compared to the big empires. That's the power of God. And so he's saying, Lord, we recognize your power. If anyone can save us from this, it is you. That is now called the transference of trust. It's hard to do. I'm not saying it's easy. Most of the time, we will rely on ourselves, our intelligence, our strength, our 
uh, networks. We'll try it first. And then God becomes a last resort. <laughs> I was reading the book, Too Busy Not to Pray. I think it was Bill Hybels who authored it. He said, are you aware that sometimes even prayer you use as an emergency kit? You only break the glass when you cannot work out the situation anymore? But that's a bad way of doing your uh, committing to a prayer life. Prayer is communion or communication with God daily. What kind of a relationship does not have good communication? A bad one. We keep on saying we are committed, we are related to Jesus Christ because He's our personal Lord and Savior. That's the relationship. If you have a relationship with Him, are you communicating with Him regularly and properly? If not, what kind of a relationship do we have with Him? So Habakkuk at this point understood, I have to go back to the proper habits, recognizing the presence of God always, even though we're going to be experiencing difficulty. Talking to Him, trusting in Him, will now make us change the way we do things. We will now be able to follow Him rather than resist Him. The second thing in connection to prayer for strength, he realized that our circumstances does not diminish God's capabilities. Maybe he's seeing that in the future we will be overtaken by a powerful empire. But it does not mean God cannot help. Actually, the Lord can do what he wants. But he has a procedure and everything is worked out according to his will and according to his timing. But human beings, we want things to be instant. We go a different direction from what God wants. When consequences happen, we want to be quick. Tapos na to. No more hardships. No more difficulties. No more consequences. That's what we want. But that's not how the Lord deals with people. That's not how the Lord deliberates situations. He will process you. If it has to take a longer period of time, He will take His time. If it's a short period of time, it depends upon His judgment. That's how he deals with people. That's how he was dealing with Israel. You know that uh, accident I was telling you about 19 years ago? At first, I was really... I have yung spiritual tampo. No? Let's call it spiritual tampo. Uh, because during that, I was... Uh, like everybody else, probably you're using emotional blackmail on God. Have you ever done that? God's not answering my prayer. I won't pray anymore. As if God will lose something. Uh, the Lord man, is not favoring me, always favoring other believers, but not me, favoritism. I won't read the Bible anymore. I won't go to church. When it's my time to request, the Lord will not provide for me. I won't serve na lang. What do you think will happen if you leave behind the presence of God? Who is the source of wisdom and guidance? God. Then you want to part ways with Him? Sang kapupulutin. Who is the source of blessing? God. And you want Him to be out of your life? What happens to you? You will all the more experience ruin. That's the impractical way to go. The right way to go is to cling to Him, come to Him, submit to Him. That's what's going to help you. Now, back then, I was a younger version of myself, but I was already a pastor. I was really having a hard time dealing with everything. Sabi ko, Lord, I'm going from one engagement to the other. Why this accident? I was telling the Lord, you allow this to happen. After a while, I come to realize I have to accept it was my driving, my habits of driving that was at fault. If I drove properly, which I had to admit humbly now, I wouldn't have had that accident. But it was easier to blame God, right? Sometimes the Lord tells you, don't do this. You do that. Then something bad happens. Then you say to the Lord, why did you allow this to happen? Well, ask yourself, why did that happen? Diba? Edmund Chan, in one of his books, said, sometimes we're saying we fell to sin. Probably we did not fall to sin. We actually edged ourselves near the border and then we jumped and when consequences happen, we blame God for it. No, it's your action. It was a conscious decision on your part. When something bad happens because you're expecting patience of God, diba? pardon of God, you didn't realize that God is serious when He also says consequences and punishment. We have to also accept our liabilities and our accountabilities. That's part of it. And this is the humbling part in the life of Habakkuk now. 
said, Lord, yes, that's going to be a bleak future later on. But I know it will not diminish your capability. If we trust in you, rely on you, we will be taken out of that and we will be able to overcome through you. Sa akin, merong ah moment. You know what the ah moment is? Di ba? Uh, at first, you cannot understand. Why is this happening? Why would the Lord allow this? Mm. And then when the Lord shows you His purpose, ah, yun pala yun. You know, during that time when I had that accident, we had a consultation with doctors because already uh, four years or so uh, had, been, had passed by and we were praying for a child. O di, napahinga ko. My wife conceived. A ah, moment. But I don't want you to go medieval on me. Ah, sabi ni pastor, car crashes causes pregnancies. No, no, don't, don't make that uh, foolish logic, logical connection. That's not it. But for me, the, the way God processed me was to realize there's a higher purpose. You have a higher prayer. But then again, your driving skills, you have to check the way you, you drive on the road. But then I come to realize even the bad situations, the Lord can redeem if only you, subject, you submit to Him. That's how he restores. That's how he redeems. And that's why Habakkuk said, he recalls how we are sustained by God's presence. Imagine what he was saying. All the food source will be gone. Everything they trusted will be gone. Riches in the forms of harvest, in the forms of animals, in the stalls, livestock. Everything will be gone. But he's saying, as long as the Lord is there, I am okay. I remember I was conversing with a uh, friend a few uh, week, months ago. Sabi niya, I had serious COVID, pastor. Thank you for the prayer, sabi niya. But during that time, I know I have a lot of positions to brag about. What will my positions do when about near-death experience? I have resources. But what can my resources do? Sabi niya, yun pala yung point that the only thing that you have in your life that is of value is your connection with God. In that very time, things or uh, machines were placed in my body. I was so isolated. Even the nurses only come to my room once in a while. I couldn't talk because a tube was inside my mouth. Sabi niya, but in my heart and in my mind, I can converse with God. I cry. I seek help. And I, as I was looking at this passage, probably Habakkuk is saying, all of the things we can be proud of as human beings, it's useless now. But if the Lord is there, we can be sustained, we can survive. And that's why the name Habakkuk is a very important name. You know, I've said this once, I'll say it again. I almost named our child Habakkuk to the protestation of my wife. Sabi niya na sa Pilipinas, kapag kayan, naging lalaki, anak natin, yung name di Mahabakuk Bansuelo, uh, masisira yung childhood. He will be teased, Haba, Bakukuk, and uh, who knows what other names will come out. O nga, no? Pero sabi ko, it's such a beautiful name. God is so wise, He gave us a daughter, Hannah. O, the H pa rin. Okay naman, biblical name. But why Habakuk? Because during that time that I was really struggling with faith, realizing my mistakes and admitting to God's power and love and grace in my life, then I discovered the meaning of the name. Habakkuk means the Lord is my embracer. Ikaw na nagkamali, pumalpa ka na, dumadaan ka ngayon sa consequence. But the Lord is saying, I'm here and I am your embracer. He's not tolerating your faults, but he's patiently waiting for you to turn. He's there to show you his faithfulness. The challenge is, are you now willing to show him your faithfulness? So remember, brothers and sisters in God, you are not alone. You may feel isolated because of the circumstances. You may not feel the love and appreciation of people. But even if all things considered, everybody left you, you feel abandoned and rejected, the Lord is there, and He is your embracer. Let's all rise. Let's close with a word of prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we truly appreciate your worth in our lives. We have no good thing to be appreciative of if you have not been generous to us. Our salvation is a byproduct of your love. The blessings we receive is because of your generosity towards us. Even though we are undeserving, Lord, you still provided us with the best. And even stated in Scripture, while we were still sinners, you died for us. At the moment that we are most unlovable, you have shown the greatest love and provided us with the greatest gift. Lord, may our faith increase. We will have, make the effort to know more about you, your character, your nature, your purposes for us what you want for us to do and what you want us to abandon and be submissive enough to accept that your will is better. Your ways are higher than our ways and your thoughts higher than ours. And that you will see a transference happening in our lives. That instead of arguing our point, sticking to our compromises, we will surrender ourselves to you and see the fullness of your blessing in our lives. Lord, may we not only be worshipers here in church during Sundays, but we will be living sacrifices every day, making our faith in you always known. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority, through Christ Jesus, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.